This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. And welcome. Diplomatic relations between India and Pakistan have reached an all-time low with expulsions and both sides accusing each other of beating their diplomats. Now with reports that the Indian consulate in Karachi may be forced to close down, all efforts at patching up seem to have run aground. Only weeks after the organ transplant bill is passed by parliament, India's first heart transplant is performed in New Delhi at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. In chess, India is watching every move he makes as Vishwanath Anand tries to get one step closer to becoming the country's first world champion. And in Newsmakers tonight, weeks of strenuous denials later, the truth is out about Michael Jackson's marriage. India's ties with Pakistan have been stretched to breaking point recently with the mutual expulsion of diplomats and allegations of beating on both sides. Little headway has been made on the discussions for a proposed code of conduct. Now in an attempt to break the deadlock, India has invited Pakistan's foreign minister to India for discussions. But latest reports suggest that the situation may worsen rather than improve as the Indian consulate in Karachi may be asked to shut down. Up and Menon reports. From the outside, everything appears peaceful at the Indian consulate at Fatima Jinnah Road in Karachi. The queues of Pakistanis waiting to get their visas for travel to India and the overworked visa officers at the service windows give the impression of business as usual. But below the surface, there is great tension at the Indian consulate. Indian diplomats are routinely harassed, their families put under constant surveillance and more recently, Indian diplomats have been physically assaulted and expelled on trumped-up charges. To make matters worse, the Pakistani government forced the consulate to reduce its staff from 82 officials to 20 last year. This has meant great suffering for the innocent Pakistani citizen who wants to visit relatives in India. The visa officer, Mr. Tuteja, can barely cope with the flood of applications the consulate receives every day. People here come and they have a lot of trouble to come and go. It doesn't look good for us, but we can't give them a lot of visa. We have a lot of staff, so I can't do anything from it. Press reports in Pakistan indicate that the government is seriously considering the closure of the Indian consulate at Karachi on the specious grounds that the consulate staff is involved in fomenting trouble there. Pakistan has found it convenient to blame Indian intelligence for the ethnic and political tension in Karachi. The army was called out recently to control ethnic violence in the city. A report by a Pakistani journalist in today's Times of India quotes a politician in Karachi as saying, if the raw fellows in the Indian consulate, despite the tightest possible surveillance by Pakistani hounds, can cause havoc in Sindh that they are credited with, they must really have superhuman qualities. At the diplomatic level, India has made it known to Pakistan that a closure of the Indian consulate would impede the normalization of relations. This was conveyed by the Minister of State in the External Affairs Ministry, Mr. R. L. Bhatia, to the Pakistani Foreign Minister, Sardar Asif Ali, in Dhaka recently. We emphasize that uh, this is totally unwarranted action on their part. It will cause a lot of trouble to the people of Karachi and Sindh, you know, who get visas and come to India. There will be a great dislocation for that and their action is uh, totally uh, unwarranted. Ever since Pakistan failed in its attempt to introduce a resolution on Kashmir at the Human Rights Commission in Geneva earlier this year, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto has stepped up her campaign to internationalize the issue. 
Pakistan is currently a member of the UN Security Council and plans to introduce a Kashmir resolution in this year's General Assembly session. They want to keep attention not simmering but really keep attention at a high level of tension uh, in order to ensure that it does not fade out of international priority. It did not disappear from the concern of other nations and that it uh, remains an issue which can be used as a basis of whipping up national emotion. Most experts believe that as India comes closer to a domestic political solution to the Kashmir issue, Pakistan's campaign to internationalize it will become shriller and sharper. That would explain the current media campaign in Pakistan on the alleged disruptive activities of the 20 diplomats working at the Indian consulate in Karachi. If Pakistan forces the closure of the Indian consulate in Karachi, it will worsen India's already tense relations with that country. It will also expose Pakistan's claim that it is serious about normalizing relations with India. And it will show that it is prepared to sacrifice the interests of its own citizens to internationalize the Kashmir issue. This is Appan Menon in Delhi for The World This Week. That was Appan Menon reporting on the deterioration in the relationship between India and Pakistan and the possible closure of the Indian consulate in Karachi. Moving halfway across the world, this week the United Nations authorized an American-led invasion of Haiti to restore democracy and oust the military. But President Clinton appears to be hesitant about going ahead because he is apparently unsure of political support for the move. Several Latin American nations have opposed US intervention as it brings back disturbing memories. And critics in America say restoring democracy in Haiti should not be America's concern. In the face of an imminent invasion sanctioned by the United Nations, the military rulers of Haiti have resorted to animal sacrifice and voodoo ritual. They are the last weapons in their armory after they seized power in 1991 from Jean Bertrand Aristide, the first democratically elected president of the country. The military rulers of Haiti know their time is up. On Sunday, the United Nations Security First Council against. approved an American resolution similar to the Gulf War resolution of three years ago that would authorize a multinational force led by the U.S. to throw out Haiti's military rulers and restore President Aristide to power. But no precise deadline has been set for the invasion of Haiti. Well, we are, have not set a deadline uh, because we believe that they are now going to have to get this message. We have not said what Sue means specifically because we want the pressure here to work. The Americans have estimated that for any invasion to succeed, a force of 20,000 men would be required. While the bulk of the invasion force would be from the United States, contributions from other countries are less forthcoming. Most Latin American nations are reluctant to participate in the military invasion because of memories of American colonialism in the region. At a crucial meeting of the Organization of American States two months ago, a majority of the members including Brazil, Peru, Ecuador and Uruguay rejected the use of force in Haiti under any circumstances. Canada, Venezuela and Argentina agreed to contribute troops though only for a peacekeeping mission. At the same time, President Bill Clinton is under increasing pressure from black members of Congress to take a strong stand on Haiti. But dictatorships kill. And uh, those who say that we should not follow this policy uh, usually are those who say, let's walk away and leave the dictatorship in place. Since Clinton needs their support to push through important health reform legislation, he has to push harder on the military option. But opinion polls indicate that many Americans are ambivalent about getting involved in a situation where American soldiers could end up losing their lives. In a recent opinion poll, 65% were in favor of giving more time for economic sanctions, now in force, to work. But 51% said it was okay to send troops, provided they were part of a larger multilateral force. But the continuing influx of Haitian refugees into the United States has become too serious to be ignored. U.S. naval and coast guard ships have picked up more than 20,000 Haitian refugees in recent weeks. About 100,000 more are expected to sail for American shores when the weather improves. Haiti is very much in our backyard. The people wanted democracy. Uh, there is the, the continuing issue of whether there would be another exodus of Haitians trying to come to the United States. Clinton is caught in a dilemma and unfortunately past history is of little comfort. In 1915, 
American troops invaded the island and ended up staying there for 18 years without making any impact on Haiti's political evolution. Today, the aim of restoring democracy in Haiti may appear more noble, but the compulsions of intervention are rooted in America's domestic politics. Coming up after the break, the first ever Indian heart transplant. And India's chess king, Vishwanath Anand. And in Newsmakers, the new sound that's breaking language barriers. Welcome back to the world this week. Just a few weeks after the organ transplant bill was passed by parliament, India was put on the world map with its first ever heart transplant performed at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi yesterday. Doctors say that this marks the beginning of hope for thousands of patients for whom there was no alternative earlier. Sonia Verma reports. This week, Indian doctors made another major stride forward in the treatment of heart disease in this country. In a landmark operation, a team of doctors at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences performed India's first ever successful heart transplant on a 42-year-old heart patient. And for Dr. Venu Gopal, who performed this operation, it was only the first step. Well, there are a fairly large number of patients who are going to get benefit out of this operation. And once we sort of uh, standardize it, not only we will be able to perform the heart transplantation as a routine, but the heart and lung transplantation. The first heart transplant operation in the world was performed by Dr. Christian Bernard in 1967. And most Indian doctors considered this operation to have been long overdue here. One could have done this operation uh, 10 years ago without any um, you know, favor of you because the, technically one has the knowledge, and expertise and uh, infrastructure facilities in a place like this. However, earlier in India, such operations were against the law because death was recognized as having occurred only after the heart had stopped beating. That meant that organs like the heart and liver, which regenerate very quickly once the heart stops, could not be transplanted. But with the recent passing of the organ transplant bill by parliament, Indian law now recognizes brain death. This means that a person can now be declared dead even if the heart is still beating. For example, if the person is involved in a road accident and the functions of his brain have stopped irreversibly, he is considered dead. His healthy heart can then be transplanted to another critically ill patient. Devi Ram, who was suffering from heart disease, had only been given about six months to live. The bill literally saved his life. His new heart was donated by an unidentified female donor who died of a brain hemorrhage that very night at the same hospital. And when the world this week was allowed an exclusive visit with the patient, he seemed to be doing fine. And with heart transplants being almost impossible, as well as prohibitively expensive and Indian to undergo abroad, this operation opens new vistas for Indian heart patients. Unfortunately, a transplant abroad is uh, not a welcome feature by the, any other centers. Though it costs about anything like a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars in various centers but because of the fact that they themselves their countrymen are uh, uh, finding it the paucity of the available hearts uh, it's not possible for them to provide their donor hearts to foreigners look for example in America in the last three years they have reached a plateau of two thousand cases a year and uh, as per the estimate, 60% of the patients who are enlisted for a transplant, they die before the transplant is a donor is available. And in the West, this has led to the testing of animal organs for transplant to human beings. However, heart transplant is still in its preliminary stages in India. The operation here would cost around 40,000 rupees and nearly as much for follow-up care. But for the long list of patients in the last stage of heart disease, it could literally mean the difference between life and death. Medical history being made in India this week. Vishwanath Anand, India's grand master of chess, currently in the quarterfinals of the FIDE World Championship, is well on his way to being India's first ever world chess champion. 
As the country holds its breath and waits and watches every step he takes, Renu Rao reports on the moves he made in Hyderabad this week. After looking like a walkover, Vishwanath's quarter-final match against the American Gata Kamsky has turned into a real cliffhanger. Anand accepted defeat today after his hopeless overnight position. With this second defeat in a row, Anand and Kamsky are level at 3.5 points each with only one game to go to be played tomorrow. In the final game, Kamsky has the traditional advantage of playing white and starting the game. But he also has a major psychological advantage. After trailing badly, he's made a spectacular comeback. A rare turnaround in chess. Um, to be honest, yesterday I really played uh, awfully. Um, I don't think there's too much need to scrutinize what I did. I just played miserably. Uh, so, you know, it's just one of those days. Anand says he is not predicting which way the quarterfinals will go. His attitude is to go out and play whatever the result. Apart from yesterday's match, have you found the going tough? Well, it's a tough match and he's a tough player. Uh, you know, in general, the, the match was quite positive for me. But, uh, you know, I, I really, I'm not, I'm not into summing up the match uh, while it's still going on. So, in general, it's been quite a tough match, it's clear. The matches are being played at Sanginagar, 32 kilometers from Hyderabad, and six grandmasters are engaged in the battle of nerves. Whether Anand wins tomorrow or not, in September he goes to Spain to play the semi-final in the rival Professional Chess Association, or PCA matches, the only player in the running for both titles. Dutch veteran Jan Timmen, who contested for the FIDE title against Karpov last year, says the championships with their similar format create confusion. I don't think it was necessary. I think they should have been avoided. I mean, there's absolutely nothing against two uh, different cycles. Let's say one in tournament play, one in match play. But both cycles consist of matches. And uh, this, this is actually what is creating a lot of fuss. And, uh, but apart from that, we're doing very well in the chess world. Timmons' opponent at the quarterfinals, the Russian Valery Salov, meanwhile is warming up to the competition. Uh, what do you think your chances are? Well, I think that now it becomes, um, towards the end of the ma match, much more complicated for both of us, because now mainly the um, physical conditions and um, the nerves will decide probably the fate of the match, because now it becomes really exciting, yeah. How do you feel Sometimes uh, the game can be disheartening. Match? I feel very tired. It was a very difficult game and I feel very tired and a rest. In India, Anand's international reputation has meant good times for chess and its popularity. It is also probably the reason why, for the first time, a chess tournament of this stature is being organized in India. But even among experts, like the reigning women's chess champion, Anand is still the favorite. He's got the, it's some depth from the call. Fantastic. <laughs> Experts say Anand has a quick, creative style. A lot of people say that you are the fastest player um, in, in the game. So, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it, can be, it can be both. I mean, uh, if you play too fast, sometimes it's quite bad. But, um, you know, I have ne hardly ever been in time trouble in my life. And uh, that's got to be a huge factor. I know a lot of other players who actually throw away lots of good positions and have wasted a lot of effort simply because of this the time control they have too little time for too many moves and they squander all the results of their previous work so I mean there are uh, you know plus and minus sides but time is running out for Anand now level with Kamsky and only one game to go tomorrow's match is likely to be not just a measure of Anand's exceptional talent but the biggest test of his nerves and temperament so far In Newsmakers tonight, an African singer who doesn't give a hoot about language and is proving that it doesn't matter. And in Canada, a new idea to take the glamour out of smoking. But first the answer to the question that everyone's asking. Did Michael Jackson tie the knot or not? The newlyweds say it's true. 
This week, the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, and the daughter of the King of Rock and Roll, Lisa Marie Presley, confirmed they were secretly married outside the U.S. 11 weeks ago. And the story, once described as the greatest hoax, is now the greatest romance in pop history. The official confirmation ended weeks of speculation by fans and the media. Rumors first surfaced last month that the 35-year-old pop idol had married the 26-year-old only daughter of Elvis Presley in a private ceremony in the Dominican Republic. Michael Jackson had dinner with uh, Donald Trump and Marla Maples about six months ago and said in the middle of dinner suddenly that, you know, I'm in love. And uh, Donald Trump said, uh, you know, who is she? And he said her name is Lisa. That's all he'd say at that time. Though a judge in the Dominican Republic told journalists he had married the two in a 15-minute ceremony, agents for Michael Jackson at the time denied the reports. In their statement on Monday, the newlyweds said the union was not formally announced until now as they did not want a media circus. The once married Lisa Marie said in the statement, I'm very much in love with Michael. I dedicate my life to being his wife. We both look forward to raising a family and living a happy, healthy life together. Heir to the Presley fortune, Lisa Marie's assets from Elvis's will are estimated to be $150 million, while her new husband is believed to be worth more than $250 million. With his unconventional lifestyle and legal troubles, Jackson has never been out of the spotlight for long. And ironically, by keeping his marriage secret, the high-profile entertainer only succeeded in grabbing even more media attention. It is a desperate measure to turn off the teenage smoker. Last week, Canadian health officials decided to ask Parliament to force cigarette manufacturers to replace attractive packets with dull, unappealing ones. Today, one-fourth of Canada's teenagers smoke and the rate shows no signs of slowing. Health officials say this radical proposal may reverse the trend. You have a dull, unattractive colour that makes it sort of an embarrassment, less socially acceptable for smokers to bring out in public. The Canadian Cancer Society is among those convinced a plain pack like this one would help take the glamour out of smoking. Some teenagers seem to agree. If you whip out that out of your pocket, it doesn't look as nice as that. This is like a box full of fun right here. <laughs> and this is like, it's medicine. medicine. Yep. The proposal has Canada's tobacco barons blazing. Since tobacco advertising is banned here, they say, they need their trademark colors and logos on the packs to lure customers to their brands. This is a proposal that is designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that's damage the manufacturers. Some American tobacco companies are worried about the plain package proposal too. A letter from Philip Morris International to Canada charges the proposal would be an unjustified taking of our trademark and a violation of international trade agreements. But the officials pushing the plain package are undaunted. As Canada's health minister, what I'd like to do is totally stop smoking. And if I did that, there would be no tobacco industry anywhere in Canada for that matter. Uh, and I believe that there are many people within uh, your own government who feel the same way. However, the plain pack proposal has sent the tobacco giants lobbying hard against it because if it catches on, it could mean trouble for cigarette sales worldwide. <laughs> Angelique Kidjo has been called the African funk diva of world music. Her third album, IE, released recently, is an addictive mix of folk ballad and voodoo funk. Though Kidjo sings in the West African language fawn, the rhythm and emotion implicit in her sound eradicates the need to understand the words literally. rich variety of African as well as Western music, Kidjo proves that it is possible to stay true to one's roots and hit the big time too. I'm not afraid of mixing my traditional music to other influences because the traditional music of Benin is already so rich and so modern that it's not afraid to face anybody else or anything else. 
And I think that it's another way of letting people know about my country and about my tradition than to keep it away from the rest of the music. For me, music doesn't belong especially to a country or to a continent. Music belongs to everybody. And that's it for tonight then, in a week in which medical history was created in India with the first ever heart transplant. Till next week then, from all of us here, a very good night.